Hi, this is Jen Rubin, and this is Jen Rubin's Green Room. It's only Tuesday, and it seems like we've already had a week or so of news. Let's start with a tragedy in Israel. The Israelis accidentally set off a strike that killed seven of Jose Andres's World Central Kitchen employees. These people, I think, are angels, and most people feel the same way. It is an enormous tragedy, and of course, Israel bears responsibility. Bibi Netanyahu got out there and said, well, this is war. This happens. This is why you need to curtail war. This is why you need to bring it to a close, because innocents are harmed. It's bizarre thinking. It's absolutely maniacal thinking that Israel simply goes on without a concern for the damage they're doing along the way, without concern for the damage they're doing to their own reputation. But this is only a stunt, I believe, at this point, this continual, ongoing, grinding war for him to stay in power. And this invasion of Rafa, the administration, our administration, hasn't heard any plan for it. I don't know that he has a plan for this. Again, if he simply delays, he talks tough, he promises a invasion to end Hamas once and for all, then his right-wing coalition sticks together, he makes the Americans upset, which in turn draws his coalition even closer, and he stays in power. We've got to put an end to this. We've got to put our foot down. We have to demand not simply an Israeli investigation, but an international investigation, and we have to level with them. At some point, the war becomes disproportionate to the harm they're doing as measured against the security they are gaining. That's when you get into the realm of war crimes, when you are disproportionately hurting innocents for very little in return. And we're really getting to that point with Israel. Whether Biden can force the issue or not, I think there is growing alarm in Congress to cut off military assistance, and there is growing pressure to speak out even more forcefully uh, in favor of a negotiated end to the war. Now, granted, Hamas has to tango as well. Um, you can't have a ceasefire without both sides. But frankly, the Israelis have been just as much of an impediment to peace as Hamas has been. And they have to give up on this notion that they're going to fight forever and rid the area of every single Hamas fighter. You can't do it without a disproportionate amount of harm coming to others. We also yesterday, on Monday, had the Florida Supreme Court decision. They actually made two decisions. One was to say, you know, that constitution, the state constitution we have that we used to say protected privacy, it doesn't really protect privacy. We're taking that away. In the short term, that means that the 15-week ban that uh, was in place uh, previously comes back, but it also means that the six-week ban that George, that George, that Ron DeSantis enacted, so he could one up Trump on the forced birth crowd. That is likely to come into play. A six-week ban. Many, many women do not know they are pregnant at six weeks. You are essentially banning all abortions. But interestingly enough, the same Supreme Court agreed that there should be a ballot measure that will also appear on the November ballot along with the presidential race, along with the U.S. Senate race, where Rick Scott is running for re-election. And that would guarantee access to abortion, it would essentially say the state cannot ban it. It cannot pre prevent women from making this decision. So now you have the perfect battle. Do you want to adopt the right-wing world in which no woman can obtain an abortion, even before she knows she's pregnant? And on the other hand, do you want a world in which women get to choose, women get to make health decisions, doctors don't run around afraid that they're going to be thrown in jail if they treat a miscarriage, for example. Women don't have to wait until they are death door before obtaining health care. That's the choice. And it is so clear in Florida, it is front and center, 
And I think the Biden team understands this. They were very, very fast off the gun. This morning, they put together a press call. Both the vice president and the president put out statements deploring the portion of the Supreme Court decision that would enact uh, effectively the six-week ban. This is presenting the choice, and this choice is going to be presented all across the country. In some places like Arizona and Montana, there will be a measure on the ballot that will drive outcome, but it's really going to be on the ballot in all 50 states, and that's because if the Republicans get back in power, they've not been shy. They want a nationwide abortion ban. Whether it's six weeks, whether it's 15 weeks, it doesn't really matter. They want to take this role away from women, away from doctors, and we are going to face tragedy after tragedy like we've seen in Texas, where women are come right up to the brink of death because they have to be sick enough to justify a abortion to save their lives. You're going to see more and more OBGYNs refuse to treat pregnancies. You're going to see primary care doc doctors disappear from many areas. It is going to be a tragedy for the whole country. And that is on the ballot in 2024. By the way, there couldn't be a worse issue for Republicans. They are the proverbial dog that caught the bus because there's a recent poll out from Fox, from Fox News, an all-time high of people uh, say that they favor little or no regulation on abortion. And in fact, the people who want absolutely no regulation is also at a record high. And oh, by the way, they don't like the six-week and the 15-week bans either. They see right through that. So you've got an issue which is overwhelmingly unpopular, and that's what Republicans are going to run on. This is why I'm a little bit more optimistic than the average commentator these days, because that is going to be central to the campaign. Lastly, we also had another run-in in New York court system with Donald Trump, of course. Now, if you remember a few weeks back, Judge Juan Rashan, who is the judge presiding in the falsification of business records case, a criminal case, issued, short term, a gag order. And that prevented Trump from attacking court personnel, from attacking jurors. So what did Trump do? He instantaneously went out there and started passing rumors, threatening, vilifying the judge's daughter. Yeah. Her, the daughter. What did Alvin Bragg do? He did the right thing. He said, could you um, maybe clarify your prior order? Does this apply to family members? Now, of course, he didn't think it applied to family members. He was inviting the judge to amend the gag order, and he did. He wrote a five-page opinion that really blasts Trump, that takes him to task for trying to delegitimize, trying to threaten the entire legal system. And boy, is he right. It is entirely intolerable that anybody, let alone someone running for president, should do this, should be able to impugn the integrity of the judge, should be able to threaten family members. And as the judge points out, Donald Trump has the ability to mobilize millions of people, some of them completely unbalanced. And we've seen that. We've seen death threats against other judges. We've seen how prosecutors have to have round-the-clock security. That is the world in which Donald Trump operates, the world in which he thinks he's absolutely above it all, where no rules apply to him, where any in interference with his, quote, First Amendment rights um, is a grave injustice, and he becomes a martyr. I got news for him. The criminal defendants out on bail do not have unlimited First Amendment rights, and he is out on bail. Don't forget, he can be fined, he can be held in criminal contempt if he violates this, and ultimately he can be incarcerated. Now, do I think he's going to be incarcerated? No. But I do think we're going to see a series of fines and escalating punishments because Donald Trump cannot control himself. He is incapable of behaving like a normal person. He is incapable of containing his rage. And he's going to do this over and over again. 
and in the courtroom, do you think he's going to be able to sit there with his mouth shut calmly as evidence comes in day after day, week after week? I don't. I think he's going to blow. I think he's going to be a constant, belligerent, outspoken, complaining, whining, protesting figure in that courtroom. And I got to think, a New York jury is not going to like that. Why can't he just sit there and behave himself, even in this context? And when he does that, he simply confirms to jurors that this is a guy who thinks the rules don't apply to him. And they would be right in making that assumption. Well, the good news is we're coming up on jury selection. Yeah, next week, mark your calendars. You should do your taxes because your taxes are due next week too. But the real big date is April 15th. And that's when we're going to get this thing underway. Now, will Trump try to pull off some last minute stunt to delay, to make excuses why he can't go to trial? Of course he will. But I don't think it's going to work. I think he is finally going to be facing the music. And isn't that a pleasant change of pace? Well, if you like this program and you're like our other programs, please tell your friends they can click there to subscribe. They can follow us and subscribe at YouTube, at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever they get their podcasts. Bye-bye.